Every day between now and November, the American people are going to know that the only reason the border is not secure is Donald Trump and his MAGA Republican friends. Now, it doesn't address everything I'd like uh, that I wanted. For example, we still need a path for, of documentation for those who are already here. And we're not walking away from true immigration reform, including permanent protections and a pathway to citizenship for young dreamers who came here when they were children. Yeah. Joining me now is Senator Ron Johnson from the state of Wisconsin. Senator, honestly, I know you've been in politics a while and you're in the United States Senate, so you really, really understand how this goes. These people just lie about everything all the time. Everyone knows they want the border open. Everyone can see this. And they just lie without, with such ease. Does it get old? Well, the problem is these people include most people in the mainstream press who are advocates, advocates for their radical left positions, for their open border positions. So you know, it's not a, not a level playing field. It's not a fair fight. But uh, no, it, it, it is you know, enormously frustrating. And then it's even more enormously frustrating when you have somebody like Leader McConnell who is willing to play right into their hands. You know, we, we've taken a subject that the vast majority of American publics agree with us on. They want a secure border. And we entered a process of secret negotiations with Democrats in the Senate and the administration, people who want an open border that caused the problem that, uh, you know, and, 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 we, we gave them secret negotiations, gave them political cover, and now we're getting blamed for this. Uh, and of course, you know, I think it's lame, but the mainstream press will pick up exactly with what Biden's saying here and they will blame us as well. So you know, the, the only way we can get ourselves out of this box canyon that uh, McConnell let us into is we need to keep this debate alive. As we just came from Senate lunch, arguing that we need to devote, uh, defeat both cloture votes on, on the supplemental packages include the border security and then the clean supplemental. And, and we need to do everything we can to secure the border. And the way we start, and this should have happened three months ago, is just lay out the obvious that President Trump had enough authority given to him by law, in law, to secure the border. President Biden had that same authority that he used to reverse President Biden's or President uh, Trump's secure border. I mean, he opened up the border. He wants an open border. He caused this. And also point out the fact that if a Democrat president really wants to secure the border, we'll do everything we can to help him. I mean, if there are, he's already got the authority, we'll support that. We're not going to challenge him in court like leftist open border types challenge President Trump. If somebody does successfully challenge him, we're happy to write the legislation to override that uh, wrongful court decision. So again, again, it's not a fair fight. A Democrat president could easily secure the border. It was more challenging for Trump, but he still did it under existing law. We didn't need this Rube Goldberg uh, piece of legislation that codified a lot of President Biden's open border policies, normalized thousands of illegal immigrants a year, spent billions to stand up enough Customs Border Patrol agents to handle thousands of people a day, funded sanctuary cities, which is just gonna be a, a more effective draw for more illegal immigration. Again, this bill was so awful. That's the reason it went down in flames in under 24 hours. But yet you've got Leader McConnell saying, oh, it's it a great bill. Um, the only reason it didn't pass is because of President Trump and these, you know, he's basically, you know, he's using Democrat talking points and it's infuriating. Senator, are there moderate Democrats when it comes to illegal immigration? I, I understand that nobody can come out and be a moderate Democrat when it comes to illegal immigration publicly now. I, I understand that they all have to be a bunch of open borders, nut jobs in front of the camera. But and I'm not asking you to name names. Tell me there's one or two Democrats when the cameras are off who say, hey, Senator, man, this is crazy letting all these people in. Please tell me there's one. Well, not necessarily when the cameras are off. I mean, that's a given when they're up for re-election. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, you know, what, you know, we have repeatedly had, had votes to just complete the wall that we had bought and paid for under Trump that was costing us more not to build than to complete it. And so we had uh, amendment votes in, in committee and on the floor. Every Democrat, I think, except for Joe Manchin, always voted uh, against completing that wall. That, that tells you an awful lot. It does. Speaking of Mitch McConnell and needing to go, you were part of this press conference here. Here is Ted Cruz. It's a time for 
Mitch McConnell to go? I think it is. Look, everyone here also supported a leadership challenge to Mitch McConnell in November. Um, Senator, that's quite a thing. What happened to Mitch McConnell's power? Because he's had a lot of it for a very long time. You being willing to put your name, face on it, Senator Cruz, others. That's quite a sea change. What happened? Well, I would say there's a growing number of colleagues that are getting a little tired of uh, Mitch's strategy. I was trying to find you know, nine or ten of us to join with Democrats to pass the Democrat priorities. I mean, he, he's very skilled at doing that. Uh, what he's failed to do is unify Republicans and divide the, the Democrats to enact good policy for the American public. Um, you know, during his leadership, uh, he became leader I think, in 2007 when the debt was below $10 trillion. Now it's approaching $35 trillion, and there's been one constant during all those years, uh, one individual who's been in every debt ceiling uh, negotiation, budget negotiation, appropriations uh, negotiation, that's Mitch McConnell. That's that's not a record of uh, effective center-right uh, leadership. That, that's an example of total and abject failure when it comes to fiscal conservatism. Okay, assuming he's on his last legs as leading the Senate GOP, I have a great deal of concern over which loser would replace him because that's generally who ends up in leadership. It, you know, I'm not going to name names. not going to put you in an awkward spot. Is there a chance we get a good one, that we really need a good one? Why isn't Ron Johnson going to be the leader of the GOP in the Senate? Well, first of all, I'd prefer not to. Um, it's, it's, again, it's not an easy task. I mean, it's, it's hurting cats, but you know, Rick Scott was willing to. And Rick Scott has an amazing yeah. uh, life and resume. He's done a lot of great things, really set Ron DeSantis up for success as, as governor of Florida before Ron DeSantis you know, uh, built the largest a hospital group uh, in the world, uh, rose out of nothing. I mean, I think with a single mom, the guy's got an incredible story. And what I've seen him as a senator, I mean, he, he is just relentless. The Energizer buddy, he's the one that uh, hosts weekly uh, dinners with House conservatives. That's it's why we got past the debt ceiling. Now, unfortunately, McCarthy, uh, very McConnell-like, uh, didn't negotiate $1.5 trillion using the leverage those conservatives gave him. He suspended the debt ceiling to tune about Four trillion dollars, which frittered away about two point five trillion dollars worth of leverage, where we could have used it for other things like the Reins Act or, or you know, other conservative uh, uh, types of things. So that, that's the problem with with Republican leadership in the past. They've never even sought leverage in these negotiations. They've just they've just gone along. And like I said, in Leader McConnell's case, he's just been expert at getting just enough Republicans uh, afraid of a shutdown or or whatever, uh, happy to spend money, uh, earmark to join with Democrats to pass their priorities. And again, I, I, I've been sick of it for quite some time. I think a growing number of colleagues are starting to understand that. And I think this, this border negotiation, the secret border negotiation, that again, we should be on the right side here. Nobody should be blaming us. This is completely Biden and his Democrat colleagues in the Congress's fault. The fact that uh, the leader maneuvered us in a position where Democrats and the media are blaming us for the open border, I mean, this is beyond absurd. It is. Senator, go get him. I appreciate it. I'm glad you're speaking out about it. What I found when I looked into how the RNC is spending donor money is that over $3 million since 2017 were spent on private jets. That's in addition to the... Uh, the commercial flights that probably the lower rung staffers have to take to where they're going, uh, $750,000 on floral arrangements. And these are not flowers for events or fundraisers. If you're a staffer, a senior staffer, you get to go to things like uh, a Raiders game and a private box paid for by RNC donors or a retreat at the Salamander Resort and Spa that's about $1,000 a night just for the room. $43,000 at Top Golf. Uh, $13,000 for shows like The Lion King on Broadway, insane amounts of spending, and $17 million on donor mementos. Oof. I will say this, though. I love Top Golf. I don't know the last time you went to a Top Golf, but they actually have these nachos now with this kind of chimichurri sauce on them and a little queso or something. It's fantastic. I prefer the RNC didn't use our money there, but either way, Top Golf is fantastic. Joining me now, 
the lady who broke this story, bringing down apparently Ronna McDaniel, Jennifer Van Lahr, managing editor, redstate.com. Jennifer, where did you learn this journalism thing? Interestingly, I worked in the criminal court system before I was a, a journalist. And when you sit through the 30 plus murder trial, trials, you watch how detectives build a case. Ah, well, that would explain this. Now, okay, first of all, what got you to dig into this? Were you just angry one day at the RNC? This is, this is a big moment right now, exposing this kind of, I would just call it naked corruption, but exposing this stuff. What prompted you to dig into it to begin with? To begin with, I was given a report that had been prepared by a, a background search firm that just did the expenses in the 2020 election cycle, what the RNC had spent, and showed a lot of amounts on the limos and the flowers and the private jets. And I thought, you know, I should go look at Ronna McDaniel's entire tenure. So, so at that time, December 2022, I went through all of that, the whole since 2017. So then this year, fast forward to November, we've heard all year how fundraising is down at the RNC. They have this cash crunch. And I thought, you know, they they had to have not kept up the spending after last year. They had to have learned their lesson, but I'm just gonna double check. And then I looked and I saw the continued spending. She only spent $70,000 on private jets from October 22 till uh, November of 23, but there were still $300,000 of limos uh, $125,000 of non-essential office supplies, a bunch of uh, money for restaurants around DC and $70,000 in flowers in uh, 13 months, $87,000 a month in management consulting, which was really just uh, contracts to her cronies. Jennifer, okay, let's pause on this before we go any further down the timeline. I, I'm sorry, I know it's a stupid question, but the flower number keeps flooring me. It floored me last time you came on, last or two years ago, to break this. It floors me now. I realize I'm a dude in a Neanderthal, so I'm not that knowledgeable about flowers. $70,000 doesn't seem real. What are they? Yeah, I'm wondering, too, because occasionally I'll order from a high-end flower shop just to treat myself to some some roses or something and i and i might spend a hundred dollars on a really really nice bouquet delivered to my house i so seventy thousand i'm wondering like, what does what is that per day i didn't break it down but it's crazy and that there's also another forty five thousand dollars in floral arrangements for their donor events for their uh fundraiser events so that's not even including that so the total would be over a hundred and ten thousand Okay, you're the one with the inside baseball knowledge here. The rumor, although it's a, a widely reported rumor, is that Ronna McDaniel is stepping down after the South Carolina primary. Is this because of you? Jennifer, did you do this? I will definitely take some of the credit. I know from friends who were at Mar-a-Lago last week who spoke to Donald Trump that he has read my reports on this. I know that at the RNC winter meeting, Last Wednesday morning, Ronna got up at a member breakfast and just shrieked about me and about Charlie Kirk and how my reporting was terrible and not accurate. And for days, she went on about how terrible my report was, had some of her lackeys send out letters. So I think by the, the reaction of Ronna, it, it definitely drew blood and it could have been the, the catalyst because you know, Luke, we've lost a lot of elections under her and Definitely she was under the microscope for that. And then this report comes out. Let me ask you this. There's families of victims here today. Have you apologized to the victims? I, Would I, you like to do so now? Well, they're here. You're on national television. Would you like now to apologize to the victims who have been harmed by your product? Show them the pictures. Would you like to apologize for what you've done to these good people? I, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> And this is why we invested so much and are going to continue doing industry big efforts to, uh, to make sure that no one has to go through the types of things that your families have had to suffer. Okay, Isabel, you have a lot to say about this. Honestly, I have mixed emotions about it. Give it to me. 
I do too. And you know, I don't make a lot of friends for saying this, but social media is often painted by the right as being this desolate, horrible garbage can dumpster place where there's nothing but horrible content poisoning the minds of the next generation. And that's really not a complete picture of what social media has become in terms of a platform of importance to educate ourselves, to engage in debate and to hear a narrative, sometimes even the truth far more often than you're ever going to get that in the mainstream media from our politicians in Washington or anywhere else where people have their pulse on the powers that be and the proverbial they that get to control the narrative. So I like to look at social media as a tool, right? It can be used for really, really good, like people myself uh, using social media to tell the truth. Like people can think about the Daily Wire and Candace Owens and Jordan Peterson and Joe Rogan, none of whom would have the platforms that they do without the gift of social media and the opportunity to reach the masses in a world that's trying to control their narrative. But it also can be used for really bad, nefarious purposes. And I think a lot of that was highlighted in this particular hearing in Congress. But Congress's assault on social media over the last year and a half or so, especially the TikTok hearings a few months ago, has really only proven to me that they are far more interested in controlling the funnel of information, what we are allowed to see, interact with, repost, share with others, uh, and go back and save to watch later to make up our own opinions than they really are about our safety. If they were really interested about people's data security, or in the case of this hearing, the safety of children, we have a litany list of topics to be talking about from an American policy perspective to keep people safer. I think in reality, these people want more control over what type of information or what they want to call misinformation you get to see every day. And as a constitutional conservative, that's very bothersome to me and goes against my most foundational values. Isabel, I'm, I'm bald, my beard is going gray, so I'm very clearly not part of the next generation, but people who look like me love to complain about the next generation. They always have. Every, everyone loves to complain about the next generation. You'll do it too when you're old and gray. I don't generally. I just generally think every generation has turds and great people, and that's just the way it is. Tell me about this Gen Z. Are they going to be okay? They get a really bad rap and everyone likes to call us the reason America is crumbling before your very eyes. But I literally just wrote the book on this, on why Gen Z might actually be America and Western civilization's saving grace called The End of the Alphabet. It's coming out March 19th. Gen Z has already proven themselves to be the most conservative generation on a policy by policy basis since World War II. And a recent study just came out that Gen Z boys age 17, current seniors in high school, are the most conservative they've been since 1950. Our way of going about reaching those traditional values might be a new age path that's unfamiliar to people, like utilizing social media or identifying outside of the two party political system and more with our values than a party, but I think there's no reason to have anything but hope for us as we increase our belief in God year over year, as we vote for more conservative values year after year, and as we cancel cancel culture itself, looking for an opportunity to find the truth in society again. How do we fight back against people who have no use for the Constitution? I mean, holding up the Constitution in the face of the modern Democrat is like holding up the Constitution to a grizzly bear that's charging you. It means as much to them. So if they don't care for it, what is it? Well, that's just the thing. Number one thing, we have to know the Constitution. We have to get the Constitution, read it, understand it. And it's not hard to understand, despite what some uh, some leftist scholar may tell you. The Constitution is not hard to understand. That's number one. So we need to get it, read it, and understand it. Number two, and this is across the board for politics in general, we need to be engaged. We, we have our right, yes, and we are free, but we will only have our rights and only have our freedom if we take the responsible step and take the responsibility of being engaged with our, with our elected. That means knowing who you're voting for, why you're voting for, and, and then holding them accountable. We have got to get back to an engaged electorate to ensure that our government is going in the right direction. That's how our founders designed it to be. Uh, just like when Benjamin Franklin supposedly left the hall and the lady asked him, said, well, Mr. Franklin, what do we have? And as legend goes, he said, we have a republic if you can keep it. That's exactly, exactly what he meant. The solution is the folks have to get engaged and be involved.
Governor, communists love crime because it destabilizes a society. We see this in cities across the United States of America. It's friggin' awful. Cities I love, too. New York, Chicago, others. Are, they're trashed now because of these people. And people like George Soros and his Open Society Foundation, they keep getting involved in every race they can to ensure these cities are full of crime. Are these dirty commies getting involved in your race? Uh, I'm, I'm sure they will. They'll bring their leftist ideas to North Carolina. And let me be plain on something. I really would love to see this happen across the nation. The word liberal has been hijacked. Uh, oftentimes we say liberal, 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 and that word has been hijacked. You know, you go back and you look what a liberal a person that believes in uh, the individual rights of man and all the things really that create this country. We're talking about leftists here. We're talking about socialists. We're talking about communists. We're talking about would-be despots that if they have all the power, you have not seen brutality, the likes of which they will commit. And so we have to understand that, yes, they're going to get involved in these races. Yes, they're going to try to sway people's votes. And yes, they're doing major damage to some of our major cities. But again, I think the way we fight back against that is having it, having folks who are engaged, aware, and understand uh, what's going on so we can make sure we don't vote in those politicians that adhere to those types of uh, policies. How do we get people more engaged? You've brought it up a couple times. I bring it up all the time on this show. I can't believe how apathetic many on the right are, just normal people. They don't, they don't engage. They're not involved. It's almost like they've checked out. It drives me crazy, but it's a problem. Well, by and large, people are checking out because they're tired of milk toast politicians who refuse to stand up and tell the truth. Oh. Folks who won't tell the truth, but instead try to just soothe people's itching ears and try to give a present a message that's, quote, palatable to everyone and offends no one without telling the absolute truth that needs to be told to fix the substantive problems we face. When you have a whole cadre of politicians who do that, no one is listening. People tune out. They look at it and see that's the same old thing. Those are the same old lies. What people want to hear is the unfiltered truth. And then they want to hear solutions of how we can overcome these problems. And I think the more politicians, the more elected officials out there and tell the truth unafraid and present those solutions that will bring a desired, desired result around, the more people will get engaged. Governor, can people support you? If so, how can they do that? Uh, they can go to my website, Mark Robinson for in for nc.com that's mark robinson f-o-r-n-c.com they can find out all about us and do all the appropriate things how about that governor i appreciate it the allegations are baseless and i'm focused on the work which was what brings me to las vegas today our republicans have indicated they may hold another vote and they might uh, have the numbers at that point to impeach you uh, if that happened would you consider stepping aside no i would not okay who is this guy What's his background? Very curious about that. Joining me now, Jason Nelson, Army, and more importantly, Marine veteran. Jason Mayorkas has been all over the news recently. The GOP, of course, screwed up impeaching him. But who is this guy and what has he been doing at the DHS? You know, the, the primary responsibility of, of being the uh, Secretary of, of, of Homeland Security is obviously to uh, including immigration enforcement, port of entry, other things like that. Um, basically, he's in charge of our entire country's uh, protection against uh, enemies that might come up through here and through immigration. And the fact of the matter is, is that he's failed. Not only has he failed in enforcing existing laws, but they've made it so that almost anyone can come into this country, thus inviting people to be sent here from nations all over the globe. And what we're seeing is an, essentially an invasion at this point. We are seeing an invasion. What do they get out of this? I get this question all the time from people. Why would why would these people want to burn down the country where they have to live too? Without getting into conspiracies, I, I think quite frankly, disorder, anytime that the government can create a problem, they therefore can create a solution, a need in which there's more government, more government jobs. Uh, anytime they can move people from the production class over to the government administrative state, they get more control over the rest of people's lives. And People crave more than money, more than anything. They crave power. And I essentially think this is just a power grab. And then you could look at votes. You could look at other things like that. But again, it's really just all about power. Mitch McConnell was behind this border bill. Even Democrat Chris Murphy is saying that he was knee deep involved in this border bill. So the most powerful Republican 
in Washington, D.C., helped create an amnesty bill with the communists. How, how infected is the GOP? Well, in, in McConnell's particular case, what we're talking about is, is his loyalty to the Ukrainian war, the Ukrainian war machine. Um, we know who funds McConnell. We know that, that that big military has constantly been funding his campaigns, have been funding a lot of the GOP. And that's been what's been holding them together over the last 20 years. And right now he wants to continue to dump money, so much money in comparison to the border. I think it's 60 times as much money when it comes down to it uh, just to tie to this bill alone. So the fact that he would tie any border security in the United States to border security in Ukraine says immediately that one, he doesn't uphold Republican or conservative values. And number two, uh, he's telling the American people and holding them hostage. And and he knows that the American people no longer want to support the Ukrainian war effort, at least not to any extent that we're seeing right now. And because of this, I, I, I know that he set this up for failure so that he could then blame MAGA Republicans. So I, I think what he gets out of it is again, more power and and having crafted this, he's told everyone that he doesn't care about conservative values one bit, much less this uh, country's security. Of course. Jason, I was surprised to see Al Sharpton, of all people, go on the news and call this an invasion. Here he was. But the border, I mean, we're looking every day at the invasion of migrants, and they're playing a time game with politics on this. An invasion? That's King Democrat Al Sharpton. What's happening over there? You know, this is a big case of NIMBY uh, biting someone in the rear. You know, nobody wants something in their backyard. It's great just to call your uh, city a sanctuary city as long as it gets you certain federal funding and and lots of uh, attention in the press. But when it really comes down to it and it starts to impact the communities that you represent, they have no choice but to change their tune. Uh, Al Sharpton has long uh, represented uh, a very extreme uh, wing of the Democrat Party, but in particular, a socioeconomic group that right now is being mostly harmed by this migrant and Ill illegal migration. So for him to use the word invasion, I think he's just echoing the sentiment of his community. And that's what it is. It is an invasion at this point. We're seeing an overwhelming majority of of uh, military age males who are coming across unaccompanied. They're coming from countries across the world, including China, in massive amounts of numbers. And at this point, again, you have to question who's paying for them to come here, who's organizing this. Uh, it's beyond the encouragement and the failure to enforce laws. But at this point, it seems almost as though people are being shipped in here. And, it, and uh, quite frankly, it's insanity. If I were to look at this from the perspective of civil affairs, uh, uh, specialists, and I would sit here and do an area study or a country study, I would say that the United States border situation is deteriorating so bad that we are beginning to look at the uh, at like a failed state. What happened with this federal appeals court today and Trump having immunity, but I guess they just ruled that he doesn't have immunity. I don't know what all that means, but it doesn't sound good. So you had a three judge panel today. So the, so the way it works in federal appeals court, so some some of the cases reach the full court, the, the Latin term being en banc for that, but most of the cases are heard before three judge panels. So there was a three judge panel that was drawn uh, a few weeks ago was when the oral arguments was. You had John Sauer, the former Miss Missouri Solicitor General. He's an outstanding lawyer as well. You know, one thing about Trump and these appeals, Jesse, he actually has some very good lawyers, um, which, by the way, um, is unlike some of the lawyers that you see on TV. Um, you know, I'm not going to name names, but some of the lawyers who are actually representing him in some of these higher profile cases are actually very good lawyers, which which is something that I, as, as a lawyer, am certainly very happy about. In any event, you had this three judge panel that heard this argument and they decided unanimously in a pure curum opinion that was unsigned. So all three of them said that they agree with the writings in this 57 page opinion. They said that Donald Trump does not does not have presidential immunity from Jack Smith's probe. The reason that this is an interesting legal question, and I actually tend to agree with Trump's lawyers on this one. It's a, it's, it's, it's a close call. I see both sides argument. It's a close legal question. Again, it's another unprecedented uncharted water question here. The question is not whether you are immune from prosecution as a sitting active president. That's undisputed policy. That goes back to a 1973 memo from Richard Nixon's Office of Legal Counsel. It was reaffirmed in a 2000 Bill Clinton era memo for the Office of Legal Counsel. That, that's undisputed. If you are a sitting president, you cannot be prosecuted, period, full stop, end of story. The, the interesting legal question is, 
after you go back to being a private citizen, can you then be prosecuted for actions that you took while you were a president? That is what the what the court today in a three judge panel said that actually, yes, you can be prosecuted. I, I, I find that very hard to believe, Jesse, as a as a legal matter. I mean, th think about the possible incentive structures for that. You know, in, in this particular scenario, Jesse, you, know, you could have had Donald Trump prosecuting Barack Obama and his national security advisor for the assassination of Anwar al awlaki the Al Qaeda affiliated terrorist in Yemen, who happened to be a U.S. citizen. I mean, do, do, does, the, does the left really want to open up that can of worms? So Trump's going to appeal this. It's going to get very interesting. But that was the ruling today in D.C. What does that have to do with his trial date in D.C.? That's the one. I, look, everybody knows he's going to be found guilty there because it's a communist hellhole. He has no chance at a fair trial. Tanya Chuck today said it could take place after the convention. What does all that mean? Well, recall that prior to to all of uh, all of this, the, the trial start date there was, was set for March 4th. And then last Friday, so before we heard from this three from this three judge panel, but last Friday, Judge Chutkin actually removed March 4th from the docket. So we don't actually have a new trial start date yet. And we're unlikely to get one anytime soon because this three judge panel is obviously not the last word on this subject of immunity. And immunity itself is something that has to be argued and figured out before we even start trial. So the next step here is that Trump's lawyers will decide they can either go seek review before the full DC Circuit Court, the full 13, 14, 15 judges, however, however many it is. That's what lawyers call en banc review, or they can try to skip that and go straight to the Supreme Court and try to hear the justice. I, I predict that his lawyers will probably try to stick to the DC Circuit for now and do the en banc review for the very simple reason you know, Jesse, you're a sports fan. It's it's kind of analogous to trying to run out the clock. You're basically trying to run out the clock here before November. So you, you basically just want to kind of keep on running the ball up the middle, try to take up as much time. I think going to the D.C. Circuit full court right now will do that rather than trying to skip to hop right to SCOTUS. But in any event, this is going to push back the trial date. I mean, right now, I think you're looking at at least a month and a half, two months before that trial in D.C. can get, can get started. It's just an estimate, but I feel pretty confident about that.